All right, so I was just saying, a good illustration of what we're talking about is how today we, we tend to think of a, a colonizer as someone who has power, right? And for obvious reasons. And certainly in our context, that's how it played out. But the, the word from which we get colonist is a Latin word, which is more or less the same word, colonist. Uh, and it's a word that means tenant farmer, right? And when you look at, say, the legal documents that the various uh, monarchies used uh, for sending uh, persons to the quote-unquote new world to colonize it, they were essentially tenant documents. You know, you get to, we own these territories, you can mine and farm them, you give us X percentage of whatever you get back. And so if you know anything about the history of uh, the world, if you're a tenant farmer, you are not a powerful person. <laughs> there, there, there has never really been a, you're essentially a sharecropper. And in Europe, the discourse of race that preceded uh, modernity and new world colonization, which kind of more or less started at the same time, was the discourse of noble race in terms of aristocracy and nobility, right? And so that was carried in the blood. So the inherent superiority and rationality of the nobles uh, was described as a particular racial inheritance that then the sort of peasant races didn't have. And so those persons who made up the peasant race, who for ages were <laughs> subjected to this uh, narrative of the nobles having inherent sort of racially superior value, went to the new world as tenant farmers. And when they had now power over slaves or natives, used essentially the same discourse, only they turned it into skin color. What, you know, our race is defined by skin color, not you know, noble birth. You know, so skin color becomes nobility, et cetera, et cetera, which is just to say that there's an entire history of the way this word has been used, and it was used to traumatize one group of people who then, when they got some power, turned around and used it to traumatize other groups of people. Uh, and so it's not as simple. You know, we have to be careful not to look at the fact that the current context we live in is so shaped by white supremacy and confuse that with that being some sort of like a, it's not as simple as like a broad-based intentional conspiracy, right? Or like a, a string theory of how power works in our society. We really at some point have to just intervene in the problem of power because at some point really these sort of uh, inverse power relationships are themselves a sort of phenomenon of inherited traumas pass from one community to another as one gets to sort of rise and another one falls. Now that's an interesting way of putting generational trauma when you think about it in such a, a broad concept. And we, you know, like here I am like always trying to say, no, you got to take this big picture approach, big picture approach. But here I am taking a 50 year <laughs> approach, you know, like I'm not including that entire history of what you're saying and how that, that, that definitely makes complete sense <laughs> as to how you end up doing that. And, and but here, like in this country, when, when we think about colonizing, it's what we did as a whole that we I can't like it seems like we have a hard time absorbing. It's not that it's not that the system is bad of whiteness. It's that the system of white power that came from colonization gives whiteness subliminal advantages. Exactly. Yeah. That can go from all over the place like resumes. So. You know, if it's just resumes and you end up doing the subliminal thing of hiring a name that sounds familiar to you, well, then over time that compounds and means that you oppress an entire community over the way you accept naming. And it's not like... Yeah, I mean, and that's why I'm personally increasingly I try to avoid a term like white supremacy, not because it doesn't necessarily describe it, but because I think to many people's ears... That um, that suggests a sort of active plot, yeah. Right. Whereas if you think about it more, for me, I prefer to think about it in terms of white normativity, right? Where we are in history, the group that got to set uh, the sort of discursive and, and moral boundaries happened to have been white, or at least describe themselves in white. Right. White isn't a thing any more than black is a thing. There's no actual essence, so you can't look at someone and be like, "You think that because you're white?" No, they don't, because that's not what they are. Right, but they might be subjecting themselves to the label of white and then adopting this uh, perspective or this conclusion, right? And, and the simple truth is, when I first got into journalism, I worked in the black press. Uh, most persons who operate in the black press happen to be black, 
uh, they're not necessarily poor. And what I found is that the way they think about poor black spaces isn't all that different from the way we stereotype white racists thinking about those spaces. And so at some point, there are certain ideas that I can't say, even though I most often hear them from white racists, I can't say that's a white idea. Because right. I've heard non-white people express but it. I'm doing the same thing as you do, trying to remove that name. And the conundrum that I lie into is this, this is how I can explain what blackness is by making the system whiteness. Because our race is, or perception of race, is independent of this power structure. So that is why you can have a black city like Baltimore and it can execute white supremacy. Blackness is that which stands against white supremacy, not that which is physically black. No, I mean, and that's why it's about the norms. And, re and norms are really a, 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 an issue of language. And, and this is what you could think about in terms of what I've talked about is truth, right? It's a function of statements, which statements we acknowledge is valid or is moral or is true or is, you know. And so for me, at least, by talking about white norms, uh, one, we just get away from the whole, like, I, you know, the, I think the word supremacy is accurate, but part of the problem with it is that it, it, it inevitably pushes everyone into their silo. Right. You throw that and it, it just becomes a discursive grenade. And so even if you'd say that is kind of the right word. Yeah. But at some point, like if it just ends the conversation all the time, that's not we do have to think about these things strategically. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That's why I'm stuck in that conundrum of the white black paradigm of power allows me to explain how it's not an individualistic thing, it's part of the system. But then as soon as I explain it that way, I draw those lines of the vision that I'm trying to erase. At the same and, time. and this is this is sort of and, and you know, and this is really ultimately what we're talking about is how we as persons who want to intervene in what we perceive to be a problematic, how do we do that in a way that doesn't then reinscribe the problematic, right? Because part of anti-racist, part of the premise of anti-racist uh, activism and discourse is that race isn't a real thing, right? But when you say uh, something like white supremacy or even white normativity for that matter, you sort of essentialize the white part, right? You suggest these things come out of an inherently and by nature white space. But that's not exactly what happens. Supremacy and normativity can come out of any space defined by any facet, whether it's religion the way it once upon a time was, uh, whether it's color the way it currently often is, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's gender, whatever. So there's always a real challenge of how do we fight this oppression without reinscribing the basic terms that make the oppression possible, especially when we have to use a language that has been inevitably shaped because of the 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 way normativity plays out that has been inevitably shaped by uh, the community that is in power and therefore that we perceive as oppressive. Yeah. I, your focus on our language made me look up white supremacy and like I've totally used the word wrong. Um, according to the definition, it's a form of racism centered upon the belief or promotion of the belief that white people are superior, which to me doesn't sound like white supremacy. That sounds like, eugenics or, or something yeah, like that just bigotry right sure so this um like by the definition of white supremacy i shouldn't be saying white supremacy either so like i can't like how the hell do we describe uh, do we these describe things? it i mean I, that's why i do think like even though you know not everybody when you say something like white normativity knows immediately what you're talking about and th that's just a function of how often you know where these words get used and how often we use them but I do think it's better to talk about norms because norms are an issue more of language than they are of like a uh, cultural or racial or identity essence in any way, shape or form, right? Norms are always norms of a specific place. They're always sort of contextualized, right? Like the norms that operate in a police department are different than the norms that operate in a fire department, right? Firemen don't say, make sure you get home at the end of your shift. Uh, I mean, maybe they do, but they don't uh, then like stand and watch buildings burn, right? It, it doesn't get sort of codified into the practice of firefighting. Yeah, I'm changing it a little bit on you here because I looked up white normativity. Interesting. And I found an article, peer-reviewed article, and it's talking about how white normativity is the often unconscious and invisible ideas and practices that make whiteness appear natural and right is sustained even in organizations that are attentive to st structural factors. But I, I, that's I, I a better definition. That's a better definition. I would just um, 
I, I would maybe just challenge it. It's not that it makes whiteness appear right. It makes ideas that happen to have been generated out of spaces we define as white sure. appear right. That, that That's the only way that I would sort of... Uh, just because otherwise we, we reify whiteness again. Like it's this thing whose essence is to create this like racial oppression. Yeah, they're getting into how this... Go, it's so funny that I pulled up this article considering this conversation because the highlight of this article is to point out how in these L- LGBT groups, mm. they still have racism that's in their systems when they're groups that are consciously Anti- trying yeah. to be aware of all of this stuff and still get themselves into this this bias. I have this at TYT. I make a joke a lot about how white male the, the panels are or and if they're not white male they're still pretty much male sure yeah. and it's like look how, how much we are people that are intimately aware that this is wrong but yet we keep finding ourselves in this position i mean normativity is not an easy thing to overcome even like with my work with stay up dot news which is a hip-hop and politics web magazine it is really difficult to overcome the sort of uh male normativity that exists in hip-hop Right. Because even though I'm conscious of the fact that I want and like I, I make an effort to try to like bring in more uh, women collaborators, I can't change the fact that hip hop culture is still, for whatever reason, at least in a lot of its um, upfront sort of uh, art making uh, functions, it's still dominated by men. Right. So it, it, in doing this, I want to intentionally not let every sort of image on my website be of a man. Right. But it's it's hard to do that because you don't come across as many uh, women. And, and that's simply a function of the way male normativity has already played out within this culture. Right. And, and so these things kind of reinforce themselves uh, just by the nature of their operation. Right. That's what and that's what that previous article was saying is that the intersection of all these oppressions end up creating this complex thing that we want to pick these nuances out of Mm -hmm. but they just don't really exist because these things build and support upon one another so if you don't kind of reboot the system who is it that said that that you you have to destroy it It was a famous engineer so we're all i don't remember but how you can't build from 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 reform you have to destroy and build the whole new foundation up again and that is what we're talking about like we have to understand these concepts realize that my dumb ass should stop saying supremacy because it's normativity or norm <laughs> what is the word normativity okay. yeah and, and that's what we're really talking about is the normalization of these concepts yeah. as being right i mean i would say normativity is a more productive way to talk about it at least within our context well, well hell the, according to the definition which we have to base our language <laughs> off of i'm completely wrong by saying <laughs> supremacy <laughs> Period, because I don't mean racism. I explicitly don't mean racism yeah. when I'm talking about the system. I'm talking about a system that has racist results. So it, it doesn't matter what goes into it. It's the system. And, and you know, with the reboot reform issue, I mean, this is why I think it's important to, to intervene at the level of language, right? Because you could redefine supremacy in a way that sounds more like normativity and that it would be the right term, right? But until we're sort of aware of the way that the structure of our language also influences the way we conclude, uh, you know, uh, 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 regarding certain issues, it's it's hard to do the reboot or the reform because we think that's, the, that's, 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 that's really the issue. Revolutionaries often think they're rebooting they're not rebooting because they haven't intervened at the level of language. They've only intervened at the level of their own personal oppression. Uh, and so they're not even reforming at that point. They're just <laughs> rearranging. That's my whole fight against all the other activists. I know. Look, just, just, you're not, you don't need to have that conversation with them. You need to have the conversation with the people who might be influenced by them, but might also be influenced by you. Because look, I mean, it's not to say, I, I, I do think that like in the anti-oppression ecosystem, the activists play an important role, even though I don't see eye to eye with them. Like I need some angry people screaming like this. Like we need those people as part of this fight. Um, but if we make that the only perspective, I, I worry that we run the risk of just finding ourselves, you know, in the animal farm situation, you know, we became what we beheld. And that's not really, I think the result that we're looking for. Yeah, and to craft our communications properly, we need to use these damn books and actually use the definitions. I can't believe I made that mistake and had a word that was so freaking off because in order to be on the same page, 
we have to be using the same language and the words have to be defined by the same thing. So I like to remind people that we don't get to change what words mean. We have a guy named Webster <laughs> paired up with some dude named Miriam and they, they, they kind of wrote this out for us so we can use what? the words the way we need to use the words. I mean, I think of language as instrumental, right? Which is what, what kind of makes slang possible. Uh, there's something sort of intuitive about slang, good slang anyway. You know, it has to be accessible, even though even if you've never heard it, you have to have some sense of how it functions. And so, I, and I think that's true, not just of slang, but of language in general. Uh, and a good example is, you know, there are words out there like, uh, like you know, people say like, you know, I didn't feel very affirmed. You know, and if you look up the like affirmation or affirm, it means like, to agree that something is true. It's like, I don't think what that person meant is that he didn't feel like anyone agreed he was true or real, right? Like, so we use it and we all hear it and know exactly what you mean. It's technically the wrong use of the word, but because of language being so instrumental, it, it can still function validly as an as, as a element of vocabulary or of language. And so I think what we need to be is cognizant of the way language works, the way language operates, and the way it can shape us so that we can be intervening both in the problems that we think language has created in terms of these power structures, but that we can also sort of rearrange and redefine and rework new tools, you know, make new tools out of language. Uh, but we can only do that if we're aware. And, and if we're aware enough where you might say something and be like, when you say that, what do you mean by that? Oh, you mean that? I mean this. Okay, do we think one is better or do we think we should find a middle ground or we abandon the word entirely and talk about something else. I think we can have an awareness of this problem, but the instrumentality of language is also our greatest enemy because we rely on the stability of language, right? If every time I go, yo man, hand me that hammer, you hand me a fucking power drill because that's what you call it. That's not gonna work, that, that can't work. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I think with an awareness, we can sort of both intervene in the problems we see, but also guard against falling into those very problems.